Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Thoughtful Thursdays speaker series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. Welcome to another Thoughtful Thursday at the library. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I want to tell you all that next Sunday here at the library at 5 o'clock, um, Deborah Royce is going to be talking about her new book, uh, Finding Mrs. Ford, that takes place partly in Watchill. Um, and then on August 15th, next month, our next Thoughtful Thursday, will be here in the library also, and Linda Christensen is going to be talking about genealogy and how we can get started in finding out something about our ancestry. So, I would like to thank Sarah Dove and Sarah Kennedy, who's been held up on 95, but is approaching any second, um, for taking time out of their busy, busy, busy schedules to talk to us this afternoon. I'm going to have to stand here, I think. Uh, for 20 years, Sarah has been the principal of the Paper uh, Conservator Studio, which is located in the Velvet Mill. Uh, her clients include private collectors, museums, and cultural institutions throughout New England. Tara is the Preservationist Services Librarian of the Yale University Library System, and System is the operative board, because just to remind you all, at Yale there are 15 libraries and 15.2 million volumes uh, that include early papyri documents and electronic databases. When talking to Sarah about how she uh, became a paper conservator, she told me that she fell in to her profession. She was about to graduate from the University of Arizona with a degree in studio art. She got on a plane for San Francisco for a job interview with a portfolio of her prints, and she got on the plane and the steward said, sorry, that's not going to fit under your seat. Let me have it, and I'll take good care of it, and give it back to you when you land. Well, the stewardess decided to check the portfolio as baggage. So when Sarah arrived, the portfolio was crushed, her prints were damaged, and back in Arizona, a professor of hers said, you should have these restored. So she went to a paper conservator, and when she walked into the studio, she knew what her profession was going to be. <laughs> so 20 years on, Sarah has treated rare art prints, watercolors, paintings, documents, uh, and maps, including George Washington's maps. Sort of sends a thrill to me. Uh, and they are, in fact, at Yale University, housed in the Sterling Library. Is that right? In the Bionic. In the Bionic. Uh, it was at Yale that Sarah and Tara met. Each one of them were working in various libraries. Tara has been trained as an art historian, an archivist, a preservationist, and a forensic scientist. Uh, she is someone who focuses, it sounds like an oxymoron, but focuses on the big picture. So she's the one who's called in to ascertain the conditions of a building, a library, a reading room uh, that houses important and rare books, documents, and collections. She monitors the temperature, the lighting, the moisture, she looks at the building itself to make sure that it is uh, a safe haven for the collections that are in it. 
Sarah and Tara now are collaborating on the Merrill apartment. They're working to conserve the art, the books, the textiles, the furniture um, of the apartment. To make, and making sure that the building itself is a safe place for these collections. Sarah told me that this is a special project because the Merrill apartment is really a priceless time capsule. It tells the story of Merrill and his partner, David Jackson's life together, and for the writers in residence, it provides a really priceless, incomparable link to Merrill himself and to his writer friends in his New York circle. So, Sarah. And Tara will be. Tip it up a little more. Tip it up a little more. There you yeah. go. Does that work better? Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. So, um, let's see. All right. I would like to start off with a brief explanation of conservation. Conservation is the preservation of cultural heritage for future generations. A conservator physically saves our cultural heritage with highly developed technical and decision-making skills gained through years of study and hands-on experience. Conservation encompasses many specialized fields, and my professional speciality is conservation and preservation of works art on paper. Stonington Village Improvement Association, or SVIA, took possession of the James Merrill House after Merrill's death in 1995. It was their decision to change nothing, um, to leave the apartment and its furnishings intact, and to provide a place for writers to live and work. Oh, sorry. So, I was going to say, for conservation, Hi, Tara. <laughs> well done. Hi, Tara. Hi, Tara. All right, sorry. I love 95. Yeah, 95 is great. <laughs> okay. Best ever. <laughs> Do you want to start over? I really it's okay. okay. I'm going to just start here. Okay. okay. Yeah, so here's parts. an example of a before and after conservation treatment that I carried out to give you an idea of, of what it what that would look like, so before and after, a large format <laughs> watercolor. So, okay, when the Stonington Village Improvement Association, or the SVIA, took possession of the James Merrill House after his death in 1995, it was their decision to change nothing, to leave the apartment and its furnishings intact, and to provide a place for writers to live and work. This arrangement, which has provided a unique and wonderful experience for writers and residents, has also presented many challenges for preservation and conservation. Since its inception, the Merrill Committee has had an ongoing commitment to maintain the historic house structure and inventory of the James Merrill House. However, a preservation plan was not in place. And in 2014, we began a conservation initiative in earnest. This coincided nicely with the publication of the first biography of the poet um, James Merrill's, um, a biography written by Langdon Hammer, who published in 2015, titled James Merrill, Life and Art. This thorough biography has been an invaluable resource and has helped us to understand the various collections and their connection to the poet's life. Our first focus on the works of art in the collection, our first focus was the works of art in the collection. A good deal of the, of the art, deal, um, a good deal of the art in the house dates to the mid-20th century, 
from the late 1940s and the early 1950s, and with some pieces dated as late as 1977. These included works by figures from the New York art world, Fairfield Porter, Grace Hardigan, Mel Blaine, Larry Rivers, and the mystical Northwest Coast artist Morris Graves. The art in the Maryland Department is largely not monetarily valuable, but invaluable in telling us more about James Merrill and his partner David Jackson. As Hammer says in his biography, most of these objects were inexpensive. They derived their value from their place in Merrill's life and imagination. They were a lexicon he used for self-expression, even while they entered and shaped his writing. And here are a few examples of pieces that we found in a, in a collection. Uh, this is by Warner Drews, who was a painter, printmaker, and art teacher, considered to be one of the founding fathers <coughs> of American abstraction. He was one of the first artists to introduce concepts of the Bauhaus school within the US. And this is dated um, 1944. According to Hammer, Merrill came to Drew's, uh, um, came across Drew's in St. Louis, where Drew's taught at Washington University, and when visiting his brother Charles, the founder of the Thomas Jefferson School in St. Louis. This is David Jackson's wash painting on paper, dated 1965. The art collections have had long exposure to light and temperature extremes. Combined with direct contact on outdated, poor quality acidic framing materials, the art and artifacts in the collection have suffered varying degrees of degradation. Our first step was to have the collections assessed by special, specialized conservators. And this is the painting conservator that we have examining the surly temple and applying uh, mending tissue so that it can be transported to a studio. This is what it looked like before it was packed up <laughs> so that it wasn't going to play more. So the, the flaking paint is secured um, with these temporary mends. Kathy provided a priority list for approximately 20 paintings and categorized their condition from do nothing to not urgent and unfortunately then to emergency and immediate intervention needed. <laughs> the largest collections in the Maryland apartment, however, are paper-based works of art on paper and books. Uh, paper conservators surveyed the works of art on paper consisting of approximately 100 framed art objects. During the survey, it was found that more than half of the works were at risk after being overexposed to light, being in direct contact with the acidic matting materials, and had been attached with poor quality tapes. This is Morris Graves. It's a print after a painting. And this detail shows here, this is um, where the mat, the window mat was over the paper, and that's the, the degree of darkening within the window mat, and then the paper's also darkened from the window mat. The label on the reverse um, identifies it as a specially issued print and dates it. And this was something we didn't know because it was still in its original framing. And it, it is a silk screen facsimile. It's actually printed in tempered paint, so it looks very much like a tempered painting. Mm -hmm. The paper itself is poor quality to start with. It's not a good about paper, so that doesn't help matters. Yes. An architectural conservator evaluated the condition of the windows. Several furniture conservators evaluated the bookcases and furniture, and historic carpet specialists reviewed the Chinese rug in the, in the sitting room. Further assessments were carried out by a book conservator and a conservation framer. 
finally a specialist of historic wallpaper will be visiting us this fall to review the wall the bad wallpaper. <coughs> Other collections in the Merrill House include uh, textiles such as the single work oops, by Merrill's mother. Uh, At the conclusion of, uh, of these various surveys, it was recommended that we create a uh, preservation strategy for the collections and structure and harmony with the larger James Merrill House Preservation Plan. This led us to apply for a collection assessment program, of, um, otherwise known as CAP. A CAP is a grant that supports the efforts of museums and historic houses to conserve the nation's historic, scientific, and cultural heritage. It provides partial funding towards a uh, general conservation assessment and is often a first step for small institutions that wish to improve their collections. In the fall of 2017, two conservators, a paper and collections conservator and an architectural conservator, carried out a two-day assessment and provided their findings. The result was a clear picture of the overall collection and building needs of the James Merrill House. The CAP assessment report was crucial in helping us understand that the Birch Block building listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2013 and designated a National Historic Landmark in 2016 is our largest collection item, followed by the collections within the two apartments. The recommendations laid out by the architectural conservator has directed us towards restoring the windows rather than replacing them and pointed out areas of concern in the building systems. The CAP report provided prioritized recommendations to improve care of the building and collections. Going forward, we've hired a consultant, Tara Kennedy, who will be speaking to you shortly, <laughs> and to act as our project manager. Now, onto some examples of the conservation work that has been carried out. Um, the Merrill Steinway piano has been rebuilt and is playable. This is Moira Egan, uh, one of our writers and residents, sitting in the restored chair. And the broken beams chair and ottoman are restored and can now be used. It is a what? Uh, beans or yes. And uh, we have our painting conservator has treated this painting, which was by Robert Arder, um, a student of one of Merrill's at Bard. And um, it shows the before again with those temporary bins for the flaky paint. So. The, Paintings are being treated on an individual basis. A characteristic of mid-century paintings is they are unvarnished. And the absence of varnish coating means that they are more susceptible to flaking and cleavage. Um, so cleaning an unvarnished painting is not like cleaning a traditional varnished painting. And, um, so, nevertheless, it involves specialized surface cleaning, consolidation of cracking and lifting paint, and when necessary, filling in the areas where the original paint is missing. Wow. Um, a painting of Merrill's good friend, Hubble Pierce, was surface cleaned and reframed in its existing frame, but with a new linen liner that had decayed and using conservation UV filtering glass. Pierce was the artist who created the bat wallpaper based on motifs from the sitting room's Chinese run. The wallpaper was installed in 1972 and Merrill's poem Mirabelle, Books of Number from 1976 describes the wallpaper. On the reverse of the painting was an elegy and you can see how it was taped rather rigorously <laughs> to an inch of its life. And it was really like a butterfly wing because it was taped right onto the wood backing board. 
So um, in Lanny's book, it says it's an unpublished poem, and it was a, a nice surprise to find. Um, so let's see. So it's it's typewritten and it's signed a ballpoint pen. So during treatment, I removed all those tapes with solvent, and I restore the chemical stability of the paper through water washing. The paper was fully immersed in a filtered water, pH balanced to wash and remove the soluble discoloration. After treatment, the document's preserved. Um, it was lined with Japanese paper and now can be handled safely. A copy will be made and the original can be sent to Washington University or Yale, or, uh, where Maryland's archives are. And a facsimile will just be on the back of the piece, as we found it, without the tape. <laughs> <laughs> so works on paper constitute the largest part of the art collection. Many of these have required special procedures to correct discoloration, staining, and then delivery deleterious effects of non-archival materials and attachments used when they were originally framed. This is a great example of being framed with corrugated cardboard, and you can see the corrugated pattern through the Japanese paper sheet. This was another discovery of an artist in the collection. This, this is um, Ian Hugo. So Ian Hugo was uh, an ISU men's husband and Meryl knew Ian and Hugo in 1946 and 47 when they moved back to New York City. And there are several Hugo prints in the collection. Wow. Cleaning and washing in particular must be undertaken cautiously because it's not reversible. Developing a protocol for treatment requires technical knowledge of an artist's material and techniques, an appreciation of whether the treatment is appropriate to the work, to the work's aesthetic and a realistic and candid assessment of the risks inherited in the proposed treatment. Um, Hugo took up engraving and etching. <coughs> he studied under Stanley Hayter in Paris at Atelier 17. And Stanley Hayter was known for a method called viscosity printing, which is where one thicker, more viscous ink is rolled over thinner ink and the thicker ink is rejected and adheres only to the surface surrounding the ink. So it sounds very technical, but it's something you couldn't see when it was so brown. And when it was washed, and I had to line it because it, it was so brittle and thin, um, you can see the colored inks and the texture and the process. Some of the artwork is drawn on non-archival materials <laughs> and is ephemeral by nature. This watercolor of uh, Marilyn Jackson's cat Maisie was presumably drawn by Jackson and directly painted on cardboard. This is another example of challenging preservation. The artist created this by drawing on top of a magazine page a photograph of wrestlers, and the reverse has the inscription and signature. It's by the little-known American artist John Schacht, who it is speculated encountered Merrill in Chicago in 1977 after Merrill won the Pulitzer for Divine Comedies. Again, another discovery from Unframing. Um, in conclusion, uh, I'm going to show you, this is Grace Hardigan's paper collage on good quality rag paper. And she made this collage in 1959 for a Bon Voyage party for James Merrill and David Jackson when they were embarking on one of their long trips. And it says, it's a fair one. So. <laughs> So, in conclusion, several ideas are in place for the conservation of art on paper. The majority of the works are on paper were attached to the backing boards with pressure-sensitive tape, the window mats and backing boards were highly acidic, and conservation will consist of removing the tapes and framing with these in quality materials. 
Prior to framing, the art can be scanned and reproduced. A, repro a reproduction can hang it on the walls, um, except for special occasions like our open house days, thus saving it from future exposure. Today, the value of preventive conservation is widely accepted as the most effective way of promoting long-term preservation. Attitudes towards conservation treatment are increasingly conservative, especially in museums. There are cases where when treatment is the best approach, it may need to be assertively pursued because of the poor condition of the object. The primary concern in conservation is obviously the effectiveness of treatment. However, the possible repercussions of the treatment on an object in the future is also a concern. Every treatment carries with it both risks and benefits, and, and as conservators, we can control how effective we would like a treatment to be. It's apparent that reversibility is key and often less is more. The surveys have helped us look more carefully at the collections. They've helped us identify some of the artists who made the art and in some cases established their room to marrow. We're in the process of installing climate control departments and a priority list for the treatments. Most importantly, we now have a robust roster of conservators who support our work and ongoing efforts. Tara Kennedy will now be talking about her efforts managing some of those online projects. Library is a, as a uh, preventive conservator. 
So the objects I deal with are handled all the time. They're anything from put in kids' backpacks to put on display in the Bindy Rare Book and Manuscript Library. So it's about creating a synergy between preservation and access. And they should work in tandem and not be in conflict with one another. That's really the core of what uh, library and archives conservators strive to do. So how can we provide better access to this collection? So one thing is to catalog the books. And some of you may be familiar with uh, the card catalog. I found this fun image online that sort of describes what a catalog card used to look like for those of you who are used to the online version. You have these big drawers where you look through to find the thing you were looking for. Yes, you know, I did that too when I was an undergrad and graduate student. Um, but in, so nowadays we put things on online databases. So uh, that's what, what I was helping the Merrill House do. Um, creating a database or guide so that it's easily searchable. You can search by author, by title, subject, or even keyword. So it's like a Google search for the Merrill Book Collection. And cataloging also means that we'll be giving each volume a unique number so that once the item is found, it's easy for someone to go to the shelf and find <coughs> the item, just like you would in your public library. And eventually, the call books will be placed in call number order in each room where the collections are uh, currently sitting, uh, making location, locating the books much simpler for the writers and residents if they're looking for something. All right, so we're going to see if my link works. <coughs> it's okay, it goes somewhere. Ooh, look. Ta-da! So, yeah, I do theater. That's why I sing a lot. Sorry. Um, so let's pretend that I'm interested in looking for what books we have on Oscar Wilde. You can't see that, can you? But I can. So let me figure out how to make that seem. Oh, Michaela. <laughs> Please help me. <laughs> so there is a, there's a web page that's popped up now. That sounds great. And just pop open Actually, I think it's um, right now it's locked in. Uh, Present your view, you know, and it's up to you. I'll stop pretending I know what it is. Technology is great when it works. <laughs> information about the item. So some of this stuff is, when we're doing this uh, 
front through is a uh, tool called Library Thing. This is something that actually book collectors use um, to basically create their own online libraries to uh, keep track of what they've read, write reviews, also just to keep track of the books that they have. So you could go home and make this your own. But they have this other uh, piece to it that where you can create your own online catalog. So if you're a small collection, like the Merrill House, you can do this for, you can have a online uh, search tool and catalog of your very own for a very small amount of money. Um, so it's depending on how many books you want to catalog. So it's a really great thing. You can do, um, you can put things like language, the physical description of the book. It's very much like your catalog that you would use here at the public library. And it also points to other items that might be similar in the collection that you might be interested in looking at. And so you can make those links. And it also has notes, for example, we have a lot of copies that have been signed by Mr. Merrill, or we have things that have been signed by the author, we have things signed by the, we have inscriptions in them, notes, other uh, memorabilia. So those notes are also put in the record so that we know those items are also included in the book. So it's a really great tool. Um, we have a young woman named Lauren Landy who has been doing this work for us. So um, what I did is uploaded some base records that were the work of some other folks who did these really huge Excel spreadsheets that were full of information, uploaded it into the system with bare bones records, and then I trained Lauren to do the more detailed work of going through the items, make sure everything is correct, and to also see if they could find things like Library of Congress call numbers. So that's what we're going to use to be able to find books on the shelf. So it's been working out really great. She does it. She has a job in a museum in Providence, and then during the evening she does this work online. So it's pretty cool. Now back to our regular scheduled thing. Let's see if it works. Oh, and we're back. And I'm just going to jump. Right. Please excuse me. I hope no one like seizes from from this is I'm just flashing through everything. Hey, here we are. Okay, so now I've talked a lot about the uh, cataloging and uh, description of the uh, collections. So what about the collections conditions? So generally the books are actually in very good to fair condition overall. Um, what the problems I saw when I came to see the collections was Mostly uh, years of exposure to light, dust, and dirt generally. So the books just need some care, cleaning, and overall protection in order to be still in good use for the for the collection or for, and for the writers and residents and any scholars who want to use it. So one of the hardest hit spaces um, I found was the studio space on the top floor, which is the items you see here in the picture. Um, they have lovely, lovely views of the sound from up there. They're absolutely gorgeous. But unfortunately, that brought in a lot of visible and ultraviolet light, so it caused fading and embrittlement of some of the book jackets. And that's sort of what you're seeing here with um, there's a pointer here. Um, right here, you can see the discoloration and embrittlement of the paper. And what I found interesting was when I opened a lot of these books that had these brittle covers, um, the inside contents were actually fine they were in very good condition. So it was really just the exterior of the books and the exposure to the light and that sort of, that was, that was really visible and the issue that it was mostly seeing. And high temperatures and relative humidity also play a part in the embrittlement of paper, um, which is going to be higher in the studio space, uh, mostly because heat rises. So a lot of the heat, even like during the winter time, it's going to rise up. So um, Sarah mentioned uh, preventive conservation, which is what I one of the things I specialize in these days. So this is sort of overall preservation actions you can take to improve the environment and usually involving temperature, relative humidity, light exposure, and pollutants. So what I started to do was um, to do an assessment of the environment, and that involves measuring the temperature and relative humidity of the spaces. So I've installed these electronic data loggers, and that is not the point, this uh, around the space. And so what these do is they collect temperature and relative humidity data. Hello. 
uh, in the space, no problem. Uh, in, they collect data in the space 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So the reason why we're so concerned about high temperatures, um, they tend to speed up chemical reactions. And high humidity can cause certain chemical reactions that cause some chemical bonds to break and others to reform. So when you see discoloration in paper, like you saw with Sarah's um, slides, that's what's happening. It's the reformation of different chemical um, bonds. So this data that we're collecting will inform us how the environment is doing at present. And since Sarah did mention, their house is in the middle of a project to add air conditioning to the spaces, so that will actually probably help a great deal with keeping the temperatures cool. And so that's something that we're looking forward to having. It's actually ductless air conditioning. Maybe some of you who have older homes know about this. It's, um, it's not completely ductless. It's more like no ducts, but we use pipes instead. So you don't have to put these large metal ducts through your house so it's less invasive, especially with a building that's on the National Register, the National Historic Register, you don't want to be tearing the building apart. After all, it is to a part collection object that we want to take care of. So another part of the assessment is um, invisible, visible and ultraviolet light. So all types of light cause damage, and it's a matter of the light strength and your exposure time. So it's like how long you're out in the sun is how badly you get burned. It's essentially the same thing. So, um, cause you can, and ultraviolet, you know you can sometimes, if you're, you know, from the Emerald Isle like me, um, you'll, get, <laughs> you'll get really bad sunburn, even if you're on outside on the beach on a cloudy day without sunscreen. So you can know how um, strong ultraviolet light is and how powerful it can be in terms of damage. So light too speeds up chemical reactions and causes chemical bonds to break and results in fading, discoloration, and brittlement in paper and media. And unfortunately, it's not reversible. I, I used to work in, um, I used to work as a paper conservator and did the things like Sarah did when I lived in Omaha, Nebraska. And I had someone who brought me the only copy of a baptismal certificate that belonged to one of her relatives of her grandma or great grandma, and she wanted me to, the inks had faded because she had it up in her, in one of her rooms, and she asked me to restore it. And it was like, oh, you, you can't, once something's faded, that's it. That's the end. And then, unless I'm just going to sit there and trace over it, which I'm not going to do because that's not ethical. Um, so, <laughs> not doing that. So, um, so I try to tell people like it's really important to protect your um, rare and important objects from light because once something fades, that's kind of it. So, so what I did was um, I used a light meter like this one pictured here and I went around and measured the visible and ultraviolet light levels around the mural house. Uh, so knowing the light levels means I can help figure out a strategy to lessen the amount of light coming into a space. So it's especially important to remove all ultraviolet light. It's not needed for the eye to perceive color or to make sure <coughs> objects, so it's not needed in any sort of display environment. So it's definitely something you don't need to have there. So I encourage people to um, if they can put films on their windows, that sort of thing, that will reduce the ultraviolet light. I usually encourage people to do that. Um, so in this case, um, we can't just, in the case of the mural house, we can't just simply you know, close up all the windows and make it like, you know, shroud everything in blackout curtains. Um, this is a delicate balance. We want to keep the original aesthetic while also protecting collections. So on the studio level, he had these roller sheets installed. And when I measured the light levels, I found that these roller blinds actually do a pretty good job of blocking a lot of the visible light, just not the ultraviolet light. So what we're hoping we can do is once the uh, windows are, are, are restored, is we can apply, or <coughs> actually a vendor would do the work, apply a, an ultraviolet film that would go over the windows. And nowadays, they're super simple to install. All they need is a squeegee and water, and they can be removed with baby shampoo. So it's super gentle. In the olden days, I remember when you'd have to, like, if you put that sort of tint on your car, you'd have to sit there and scrape. With the, you know, there's some sort of scraping tool in a hair dryer to get it off, and it's, it was a bit of a mess. So there's none of that anymore, which is great. 
So it'll be super simple to do install. And when, you know, if we need to change it out because it does have an expiration in terms of its useful life, we can easily remove it. So we just need to remind folks to keep the blinds down when the room is not occupied. And that should help tremendously with dating issues. So, and for the spaces where some of the blinds don't work, we're going to try and match um, these blinds to actually, so the aesthetic is uh, uniform. So the other thing we did is um, the books were kind of dusty and dirty because they've been just sort of, they've been sitting around and no one has cleaned them. So I hired a company to perform the cleaning. Uh, Clancy Collin is a company out of New York City who came to clean collections. They've cleaned collections uh, for me while I've worked at Yale for the last 15 years, and they do a really great job uh, cleaning everything from general to special collections. They use HEPA filtered vacuums that used to ensure that all the dust and dirt were contained within the vacuum, not going back out into the collections. They use soft brush attachments. You make sure you don't abrade the binding or soft papers. And dust grabbing cloths were used on shelving to collect more of the stubborn dirt and dust that accumulated over the years. It's not terribly obvious here. Um, there's some dust and dirt here that you can see, and now it's gone. I just couldn't find any real extreme um, examples, but it definitely made a difference um, in removing some of the dust and dirt. So when people pull them out, they're not coughing as they're pulling the books out. So it's a good it's a good deal. So um, so now that we've cleaned the books and we're on, and we're cataloging them and we're planning to put call numbers on the things on the books. Well, we don't want to put the call numbers straight onto these book jackets. Some of them are delicate. Some of the bindings are finer. We don't want to just put a sticker on it. So we're using, uh, we will be using these uh, book jackets, and the, the system is called Colibri, which means hummingbird in Italian. I don't know, it's a fancy name. Uh, so it's an inert pl archival plastic that will be used for this, and they're super easy to remove, so it's not like a laminate, a, a laminate or anything of that nature. And it protects fragile bindings and original paper jackets, which is great, even if the paper jackets are not in fantastic condition. It also prevents the transfer of red rot. If any of you have leather books or leather items, and sometimes there's this like powdery dust that comes off, that's called red rot. And it's sort of the uh, leather that's deteriorating because of the tannins and acidic tannins that are deteriorating the leather over time. And also it will allow the application of call number labels uh, without damaging the original bindings or book jackets. All right, I have an embedded video. Let's see if it works. Um, uh, me and my technology. Because I was going to show you how it works. You can find it on YouTube. If you yes, can I can do that. Mm. Is this connected to the internet? Yeah. Oh, there it should. projects with air conditioning, they're doing the window restoration as part of the building restoration, and additional condition surveys and continued treatment with things. So, so that's it. So, <laughs> so we have a, a few minutes for some questions and answers. Um, well, I'm going to ask you. No, you're, no, stay. <laughs> well, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> yes. Oh, you know people, so you can yes. say the same thing. Yeah, um, a lot of what you discussed would seem like it was chemical kinds of reactions, but are you running into any problems with the more biological um, critters that are troubling the space? Because it seems like the sea is a pretty active agent here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
You mean in the Merrill house? Well, it is in my house, maybe not the Merrill house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there wasn't really many cases here. No? I like, see a lot of on the shore. Yeah, like, I didn't see much. No. Moles. Oh, they're also like moles. Yeah, because you're thinking mold, silverfish, yeah. and things like that too. You're like, mold, yeah. So you're going to see that if the space is high humidity. Um, so far, in terms of what I've seen for uh, the humidity levels in, in the Merrill House, it isn't actually that that high. So you're not going to find it. Like insects really dig moisture, so they're going to totally go to the places where it's moist and hang out there. Same with mold. You need high temps, high relative humidity dark spaces without any air circulation. So, yeah. Check. <laughs> yes, sir. What's your, um, what's your plan or proposal for future monitoring of the conditions? Do you have the capacity to place monitors that at the very least um, analyze air content uh, interior atmosphere, temperature, things like that, and then transmit them to a uh, digitally or uh, to a um, to a some kind of an archival uh, data storage. Yeah. Uh, so location. what we're going to do is um, the monitors are going to stay in place indefinitely, and we can continue to gather the data and, and that, analyze it. So the first year of data will tell me sort of how is what's the current state of the building and what, how is it behaving. This is one of the things I had was talking with um, the uh, contractor and the HVAC um, gentleman who was doing the install for the ductless air, hand, air, uh, the ductless air conditioning. Because if there's this understanding that you want to have temperature and relative humidity at a flat line in a lot of museum collections. But because of sustainability issues, plus the ad additional issue that this is a collection piece, the building overall is a collection piece, and if you try to create this like hermetic seal right. of a building, no, you're going to wreck the building. So, and he was sort of surprised by that. He's like, oh, well, don't you want it to be really cold and, and like flatline humidity? And I'm like, no. I'm like, I want to know what the building does. I want to know what's possible. And try to like try to make a balance between the two right so we're going to keep the data um we'll keep the data as long as i mean we'll, i can print out reports it will be pretty something something that we will constantly be monitoring and checking so yes, yeah. uh, sarah mentioned that you know some things are not you're not able to say whether it's the paper or it's the books is there a a, a general policy or framework for um, replacing volumes with facsimiles. You talked about keeping facsimiles uh, in, you know, up on the wall when they're not visitors. But what about <coughs> facsimiles or replacement volumes for books just to keep the collection sort of intact? So we do do that um, where I work at Yale. What we do, um, a lot of the collections at Yale, I'm sorry, Yale, are in not great condition. <laughs> Um, so what we do is um, we try to determine how many copies there are in the world, how many at Yale, how many at sister institutions um, exist of that particular volume. If it's rare enough, and that kind of varies, um, we will create, um, we will digitize the original and create a new book. So that involves the work of a variety of vendors that my colleague works with and does. Um, in a lot of cases, you can't necessarily reproduce the original. So even if we do create a facsimile, it's usually so that the text can remain in circulation, but we'll maintain or retain the original because, for example, the bindings of interest, it was owned by a particular person. So for example, if somebody, um, if, I mean, if somebody famous had signed James Merrill's book and the book was in poor condition, even if we made, oops, even if we made a new copy, we would keep the original because of the inherent uh, uh, provenance associated with that. So, but you can create a new book if you need to. And there's also the issue of copyright that needs to be determined. You can do fair use copyright. So, if you have fair use cop fair use in copyright is you can create a one for one copy. So, if I create a book that's been that was uh, made in past 1922 or 23, I can't remember which it is. Um, I can do a one for one replacement. And, Pre 19, 22, 23, like anything goes. You can have 17,000 copies if you want me, so. Yes, I talk a lot, I'm sorry. <laughs>
Yes. My, my question is more for Sarah Dell, I think. Yeah, yeah. I'll shut up now. <laughs> pertaining to the integrity of the work, in the case of the one with the corrugated cardboard, how does how do you or in your field decide how to maintain a decision that the artist made about how they mounted and framed it mm. and the balance of then conserving it for a prosthetic? Right. So, um, in that particular case, that had been in, the, in its original frame since probably when Meryl came across Can you speak in the light? Right. So, I think that had been in the collection in its original frame, and so we're keeping the original frame. I, I discussed making a decision to treat it, and it was because it was in such peril, it was going to crumble. And uh, washing it was actually helping to preserve it. So do you, do you keep the cardboard, the corrugated cardboard, you know what, no. original? No. Or do you have to put it out for both? Well, I think yeah. you have good documentation. So we have documentation. We have documentation, we have photographic records before, during, after treatment, and a record. And all of, during the survey, all of the pieces were numbered. So they now have Merrill House numbers and their own records. So it comes out with a story. It yeah, comes out with a story. History, yes, it, it, it was, you know, framed by like corrugated cardboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, so we, we, because we belong to the American Institute for Conservation, I don't really need the microphone, but, um, we have a code of ethics that we need to follow, so documentation is a totally key thing that we do in order to document things like you're describing, because we have to document the original condition, and in some cases, the during treatment, depending on the severity of what's taking place. So it's like imperative that we do that. Sure. Yes? Okay. Um, as you've been working through the books, have you come across any surprises? I mean, Sarah came up with some wonderful examples of unexpected notes on the back of some of the and the paintings. What about in the books? What are you finding there? There's a lot of different inscriptions that have been written to from friends and who've given the gift books as gifts. Um, these are names I don't recognize. They're often signed by a first name. That it would names that probably would mean something to a lot of you, but not to me, unfortunately, or to Lauren. Um, I think there was a Tolkien book that was signed by the author. I think it was, which is the latest one I saw. But I think my familiarity with more modern um, English and American poets is a little stunted, so I don't know if like if they're signed by the author. I think, well, this could be an important author, but it's just I don't have that familiarity, unfortunately. But if you but search, it's going to get a record. Yes, exactly. Yes, All of that. Be able to find it. Totally. So if you do a search, even if you do a keyword search like signed or inscribed in the uh, online catalog, you can find an entire list of all of the things that have been signed or inscribed. So you're able to do that. And that's totally why we're doing this. So people will be able to do that work. Maybe one more question. Okay. <laughs> All right, pink shirt. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Rose shirt? Uh, I, I'm just curious. Of the, the scholars that are there, you, the collections are there for the scholars to use and engage. And so there's, a, there's an inherent sort of, I'm putting my grimy fingers and hands on that. So what's the strategy of sort of helping to protect and preserve the degradation of the books that are constantly being used but they're museum pieces? It's sort of something where it's that, it's that balance between the two. Um, I do think the good news is that the writers in residence there will already have an inherent reverence for the collection. So they're going to handle things with more care than, say, an undergraduate is going to with the books they throw in their backpack. So we already have that on our side, which is super helpful. Um, and it's not lots of people. It's like one or two who are going to be there over a series of months or weeks. And so it's not like an en masse kind of thing. So I think it's 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 kind of like light exposure. It's sort of also about like the amount of people that would be handling it, the number of times it's exposed. So that's kind of, that's sort of the inherent strategy in that. And that's also why we're doing the book covers, the cleaning, some of the just um, sort of preventive uh, taking care of the collection. Are there, are there any books that require gloves? Uh -huh. I, I hate gloves. Yeah. <laughs> so um, a lot of the PBS things you watch, like on Nova, where people are in the archives wearing the Mickey Mouse cotton gloves. Um, cotton gloves, we tend not to um, have folks wear those in the reading rooms. Now we switch to nitro gloves. 
And normally we ask, uh, that don't have powder in it or anything like that, what we do is we ask um, scholars who are handling our photographic materials to do that. But, so fingerprint oils are incredibly damaging to photographs and photographic surfaces. So that's what we really insist on glove, on glove wearing. So, um, and they come in fashion colors. Thank you both very much.